how Israel influences British politics. We reveal from the inside how the Israeli embassy penetrates different levels of British democracy. And the first of four programs, the battle for Britain's youth. Following decades of violence, a new challenge has emerged to Israel's occupation of Palestinian lands, called BDS. BDS is here to stay. That's the global movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel and expose it as an apartheid state. The Israeli government has responded with a campaign to rebrand the country's image. The reason we should fight BDS is because it's wrong. It's a moral outrage. It's an operation run by the secretive Ministry of Strategic Affairs. They recruit mainly former intelligence officers. Its main task is to counter BDS worldwide. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit exposes Israel's clandestine activities in London, a city that's become a major battleground. BDS campaign in many ways germinated in Britain. You'll meet the people working to challenge BDS at every level of British politics. Ah, okay, let's see what you're We work really closely together, but like a lot of it's behind the scenes. One of Israel's main targets is the Labour Party. For the first time, its leader is a champion of Palestinian civil rights. They'd be very happy to see Jeremy Corbyn no longer leader of the Labour Party, for sure. It's a covert action that penetrates the heart of Britain's democracy. Can I give you some that you suggest you take down? It is outrageous interference in British politics. It shouldn't be permitted. It's a battle of ideas seeking to change not only how Israel's portrayed, but even how it is debated. It's anti-Semitic. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's a joke. Our undercover reporter grew up in Germany and creates an identity as a graduate planning to live in Britain. Robin sets himself up in London as an aspiring Labour Party activist with strong sympathies toward Israel. After over a month of attending party functions, he stood out as a friend of Israel. And before long, he recognized a familiar face. I'm Robin. Ah, OK, nice to meet you. My name is Shai. Shai? Shai, yeah. It's a meeting of the Labour Friends of Israel, or LFI, members of the British Parliament who lobby for Israel. Uh, yeah, I take the district. So... Shai later explained to Robin the problems the LFI is facing. Not a lot of young people want to be affiliated. Mm. Obviously, when they will become MPs, they won't be affiliated, and then that's it. Chain is, is done. Because for years, every MP that joined the parliament, the first thing that he used to do is going to join another fight. He's not doing it anymore in the Labour Party. See if they're doing it automatically. All of the 40 new MPs that just got in the last elections, all of them went to the CFI, the Total Front of Israel. Okay. Yeah, so in the LFI, it didn't happen, obviously. But you need to get more people on board. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, actually. Robin tweeted and wrote articles about Israel and the Labour Party, building up his online identity. He discovered numerous groups that support Israel and which identify themselves as independent grassroots movements. One is the Sussex Friends of Israel. They organized a march to protest against the pro-Palestinian movement to boycott Israel. Robin had joined them. Shai later described the embassy's role in some of these movements. There is a grassroots organization as uh, Sussex Friends of Israel that you want to the demonstration. There is uh, Israel Britain Alliance. There is a uh, bike farm. There is so many people living in Israel. There is so many. Shai had helped establish a youth group within the Conservative Friends of Israel. They have a young section of the Conservative Friends of Israel. See if I started with it one year ago uh, because of like, my idea. And then when I tried to do the, the same in the labor, they had a crisis back then with Corbyn. 
every group has a different idea. Specifically, LFI young people doesn't exist. That's the only place that we need to track them. The moment it will become to 100 people, 200 people, then it started to become a real organization. But this will take a year. Have you ever built something, like a group? Yeah, I did several things like that, yeah. Okay. In Israel, In Israel and here. Ah, here as well? Yeah. Nothing that I can share, but uh, yeah. Something you share? Yeah, because there are things that, you know, happen, but uh, we are good to do this. It's good to leave those organizations independent, but we help them to actually... Mm. How to establish. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Right, Have a nice evening, all right? Our investigation linked the embassy's senior political officer with a series of pro-Israel groups, the Parliamentary Friends of Israel, young conservatives, lobbyists, as well as grassroots movements. In addition, Shai is involved with the youth arm of the Fabian Society, an influential Labour Party think tank. I know Shai. Shai's a good guy. He's a good friend of mine. When we engaged with the Israel Embassy, they gave us a program that was very neutral. And, you know, um, I know Shai, um, I met Shai through the process, and, and Shai, you know, in himself, he's very much, he's a very balanced guy. And if you talk to the Israel Embassy, they're not going to throw out you propaganda. It appears the Israeli diplomat's mission is to build support for Israel at all levels of the Labour Party. There was a lot of groups that were uh, educating the MPs. There's no, no one that's educating the grassroots of the people. That's it. Uh, specifically in the Labour. Yeah. Everything doesn't need it. No? Shai says he knows nearly all the Fabian Society activists. This is all. This is all in London. Yeah, you're on 200. This is active. This is campaigning. This is active. I know almost all of them. I took a Fabian group to Israel. That's right. Yeah, Martin was in that group and others. Martin Edebar explains how foreign government support helps the Fabian membership. Shai's good in terms of manpower, and he's got great contacts on both sides of Fabian Palestine and in Israel as part of his job and experience. He's a great guy as well. He's, a, he's, a, he's, very, he's very helpful and very supportive as well. And he's very balanced. I went on one of the trips of the Conservative Friends of Israel to the Middle East. It was brilliantly well arranged, very well looked after. You got fantastic access. You did meet Palestinians. If all you did was rely on that one trip, you would have a very one-sided point of view. Recently, I saw something on, uh, on Facebook that, you know, like, some really odd thing that, you know, the Israelis are not giving, weren't giving Palestinians water or something during Ramadan. I know that's false. According to Haaretz newspaper, Israel, which controls all water sources in the occupied West Bank, did cut supplies, even if the reason was contested. I've been to Israel, going to the delegation, seeing what the system's actually like. I know that's false, and I know that's propaganda. But you only will understand that if you actually go to the country. Our undercover reporter discovered that Shai Massot played a role in another key Labour Party organization, the Jewish Labour Movement, or JLM. Robin attended a summer barbecue organized by the JLM. Much of the small talk turned to the Israeli embassy. Who do you know him? Um, Shai. Oh, you know Shai? Yeah. Oh, interesting. I work with Shai. Oh, you work with Shai? I work with the ambassador. At this moment, I wanted to also kind of formally welcome Ella to her new post as uh, director. Ella was by no means the person on that pile of CVs that had the most Labour Party and political experience. But there was something that we felt on the JLM executive and as trustees mattered far more, which is that 
she's one of you. She's seen this stuff from the inside. She's fought the campus battles alongside you, which is why we took the step of appointing Ella to this role, because we think she's going to go on and play an incredibly critical role at the lead of the struggle against anti-Semitism, the Labour Party. Um, hi guys, so I've been introduced. I'm Ella, I am Jail Lamb's barbecue in chief um, and new director. And let's go out, let's change the Labour Party for the better and let's hopefully influence the future of this country for the better with a you know progressive, strong, fair society. What came next surprised our undercover reporter. Shai had asked Robin to become part of the Israeli embassy's plan to attract young Labour Party members. Elephants, Labour Friends of Israel, they're trying, they want to establish a brand of young Labour Friends of Israel. But the idea is to establish a kind of a branch that will work with young people. So what I'm saying is that if you're a teacher and you would like to get engaged, I guess they're looking for someone that will, you know, launch it, will run it. We need to try to think about, so what can you do? Shai then suggested that as well as setting up the young LFI, Robin apply for a job at the Israeli embassy. He was invited to a private meeting at a London hotel. It included embassy staff and British supporters of Israel. An Israeli diplomat takes Robin to one side. We're looking for workers, uh, for someone to work at the embassy. I don't know if it's something my interest here. I tried to me about that, actually, so I handed in my CV. That'll be it. That's it, exactly. We're also looking for somebody to work on the whole BDS, He's doing research for different BDS movements, who they are, what they are, a little bit of strategy on that whole piece. I don't know if either of those things might appeal to you. Ella Rose, the new director of the Jewish labor movement, was pleased to hear of Robin's plans to set up a young LFI. I used to work at the embassy here. I can definitely help you out. Okay. We'd love to come to any and every event you're hosting. Please consider me your number one fan. The guest of honor, a minister from the Israeli government. I grew up on the ideology that the land of Israel totally belongs to the Jewish people, not any compromise morally, biblically. The land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. The primary role of Israel's Strategic Affairs Ministry is to counter the BDS movement. It is a strategic threat for the future of Israel because if we will allow them to continue with all the lies that they are spreading against Israel, we will lose this fantastic young generation and maybe from here there will be the next leaders of the UK or other countries and they will think that Israel is a very bad country. During another meeting with the embassy's senior political officer, Shai tutors Robin on setting up a new pro-Israel group. How do you approach them? So first of all, I think you need something to sell, right? Theoretically, maybe if I would agree to do a delegation to Israel, that's always a good start. Second, Maybe you need an interesting speaker. That's maybe the embassy can help or uh, LFI can help. If you are volunteering you know, to be the uh, chairman of it, you theoretically needs to have someone that will do social media and someone that will take care of speakers or events or someone that will be the chairman of the delegations to Israel. And then you just, you know, and then people becoming, then you have a structure. Then it's not just your responsibility, you know, under you and other six people that are responsible somehow. 
they are the committee of that organization. And that's it. That's the way you establish organization. Who should I contact? What do you think? Michael. Michael. Michael what? Rubin. Michael Rubin. Michael Rubin. Right here, but you have an idea, you want to take it forward. What's his position in the LFI? He's a parliamentarian officer. Well, the reason he's died at LFI, I worked for the Labour Party before that. I was chair of Labour students. I knew Shy in my role at Labour students. We did a couple of things together. And they played around in the sunshine whilst it lasts. We talked about having a launch event, like a drinks reception, so like hiring out, you know, like the upstairs for a pub like this, uh, you know, putting a little bit of money behind the bar to get people there. So we could get some of our parliamentary supporters, so people like Joan Ryan, she could come along and sort of speak because people are drunk to meet her. And she's in contact with Shai as well, so... Yes, yeah. Uh, we still work for you, but that's we have to be quite a lot. And I sort of speak to Shai most days. The LFI appears to be looking beyond Labour's present set of MPs. The Labour Party at the moment is not in a, not in a good place to, to say the least. There are lots of good young people coming through who are moderate and, you know, good views on Israel. Um, I think we haven't really give, paid much attention to those people. You know, people are going to be in Parliament and... 10, 15 years' time. Robin tells him about the Israeli embassy's interest in recruiting him. And there we are for, you know, job opening available for the bank recruiting. Uh, so, you, know, you, should, you should chat to try. Yeah. He gave an example of how a job at the embassy could further a career in British politics. You know, Ella Rose, she was president of UJS, which is the Union of Jewish Students, a couple of years ago. She works at the embassy. Uh, but she is leaving the embassy to work at the Jewish labor movement to start this up. New guards came in and they sort of thought at some point, OK, we're going to hire someone to like help with stuff. And then all the anti-Semitism stuff kicked off in jail and vastly increased the profile and they thought, we should probably hire someone political who actually knows you know, what they're doing. Before that, was at the embassy working with Shai. Around about the same time, the JLM re-emerged under the leadership of Jeremy Newmark, who would later hire Ella Rose as the director of the JLM. The big story was about a young student in Oxford who made allegations that the Labour Party and most of the student left at Oxford was anti-Semitic. He didn't present any evidence at all. The only thing he said was that they had promoted the Israel Apartheid Week, which is a well-known event which takes place on campuses around the world. The national chairman of Labour students at that time was Michael Rubin. There were allegations on some sort of Labour club. So I, I did the investigation because I was chair of Labour students. Um, that was Labour students report. But like, there are some people who obviously asked some questions about it because that was kind of the first instant of anti Semitism. And there was lots of media leaks and talks about how anti Semitism was being covered up. British newspapers repeatedly ran stories of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. One of the next targets was Mali Abuatia, the newly elected leader of Britain's National Union of Students. She described Birmingham with Zionist outposts because it has a large Jewish society. So, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Birmingham is in, like, NUS and student politics in the UK, like... Anti-Israel rhetoric is pretty bad. You know, like Zionism is an awful thing. Like you would call yourself a Zionist, you would get ripped apart. You know, they say they're anti-racist, they say they don't discriminate people. But their anti-Zionism goes so far, I, I would say it becomes anti-Semitism. With each year of Israel's expanding occupation, support for BDS has spread on college campuses around the world. In Britain, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict defined the 2016 election for the NUS presidency. But Israel, where it exists now, is that problematic to you? Israel, as it behaves, uh, uh, is problematic to me. You would feel it would be okay for you to say about yourself that you were anti-Zionist? Yes, I would. 
Who at here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. she's really bad. But you know Robbie Young? Have you heard of Robbie Young? Mali is NUS president, and Robbie is one of the vice presidents. He's a Labour student, and he's like really good in Israel. Like he's been out on a trip, so he's seen Israel, he's seen it first hand. Like he's really pro Israel. So there are some people in NUS which you know, are quite balanced and good. Another vice president, Richard Brooks, took the unusual step of publicly claiming that Boatia's criticisms of Israel amount to anti-Semitism. Like we've never had an elected leader um, racist. Uh, NUS's uh, internal structures don't usually allow a vice president to go in and publicly criticize your president um, on national radio. But you've got to do what you've got to do. When you look at what Malia Bouati has been saying, she says it's her criticisms are a political one. She talks about Zionism, not about uh, people who are Jewish. Yeah, I think the really important thing here and something that the student movement needs to face up to is that it is for Jewish students to define what anti-Semitism is. And in the run-up to a national conference, nearly 50 Union of Jewish Student Presidents of Societies made it clear that they had concerns about some of the rhetoric. Brooks never mentioned that weeks before that interview, he'd been taken to Israel as part of a delegation from the Union of Jewish Students. I got educated on the stuff, like I spoke to people in UJS. I uh, got taken on a trip to uh, Israel with uh, UJS about two months ago. I was learning loads from that. Then from there on in, felt confident enough to start talking about some of the stuff more seriously. We were campaigning for a person running against her, obviously. Um, we didn't want her to win. Um, but yeah, obviously it didn't work. <laughs> During the run-up to the election, Richard Brooks had held private meetings with Russell Langer, the campaign director of the Union of Jewish Students. Also attending the meetings was Michael Rubin. When he was chair of Labour students last year, I worked with it, so it was me, him, and Russell from UJS. We'd have our <laughs> have little secret breakfast meetings where we'd plan how to get moderate people, good politics, and a number of things uh, elected to certain places or whatever. So me and him worked quite closely together last year. After being introduced by the Israeli embassy as a young LFI volunteer, our undercover reporter explores the possibility of ousting the pro Palestinian and US president with the help of Richard Brooks. So how can we get in touch with the people who are trying to oppose her? You speak to me, because I'm helping organize them. <laughs> yeah? So, OK, cool. So just drop me a line if yeah. you want to have that conversation, or if you want to speak to someone in a certain geographical area, I'll point you to the right people. Our investigation also revealed that the Union of Jewish Students, who sent critics of Mali Abuatia on trips to Israel, has received money from the Israeli embassy. Okay. <laughs> okay. In 2016, Shapira launched an unsuccessful bid for the presidency of the Union of Jewish Students. He also received donations from Israel to set up a new campus-based think tank. He established the Pinsker Center with former university college student Elliot Miller. I spent a year working in the government of Israel. So I was doing a fellowship in the foreign ministry, in the Congressional uh, Affairs Department, so all corporate, as far as APAC and stuff. The guy behind me is in Israel. It's like when a guy can walk into a room with a donor and the donor will give them a check for 2.5k. It's just like that. He's a genius. They also confirmed for the first time that the powerful American pro Israel lobby, APAC, is channeling money to British campuses through the Pinsker Center. I think APAC gave some money. We went to APAC in March and we got involved with APAC London. Elliot Miller remains vocal in the cauldron of London student politics.
Our undercover reporter has held meetings with the senior political officer of the Israeli embassy in London. Shai Massot wants Robin to help set up a new youth movement allied to Britain's Labour Party. It will soon be time for the party's annual conference, and he's keen that Robin attends. So we are going to be there a huge group. Uh, from the embassy, we're going to be like about five people. And uh, they're going to be an MK from Israel and eight young labor from Israel. He suggests Robin liaise with the heads of other pro-Israel movements. So Luke Erkas is the director of We Believe in Israel. He's a great guy. So you know him? Of course. So Luke is a great guy. Of course, I know him. He's a great friend. We Believe in Israel is uh, sitting together in the offices of Israel. But it's not a civil organization. He's a great campaigner. He's one of the best in the inside, in all the party. There is, seriously, there is not a lot of people like him. Uh, and Luke asked him if he's keen to. Can I mention your name towards Luke? Yeah. Shai also suggests that Robin contact Michael Rubin to take forward the idea of attracting pro Israel young people to labor. I dropped to Michael uh, an email. And so I'm keen to do that. I just need your umbrella. And then you need a business card. That's it. Can I claim that I have your support? You can tell that I suggested to, uh, to contact you, but let me support because Elephant is a independent organization. No one likes that someone is managing his organization. <laughs> <laughs> the Israeli embassy helps us quite a lot, you know, when you know, bad news stories come up about Israel, the embassy sends us information to so talk about it, yeah, yeah, you know, directly from the horse's mouth, as it were. It's quite helpful. We work really closely together. Some people would be happy to be involved in a young and a party. We wouldn't definitely be happy if it was seen as an embassy thing. So I think Shy helping with that background, yeah. So I think definitely you know, keeping sharp today and letting them know what we're doing. I think we just have to be careful for it not to be seen as a you know, young Israeli embassy, like we want it to be distinguished by itself. So like, we, we do work really, really closely together. So it's just publicly, you know, we sort of try and keep you know, Elephant a separate identity to the embassy because. It's time for members of the Labour Party to travel to their annual conference in Liverpool. Robin sits with the Israeli delegation. Shai announces plans to establish another organization in Britain, this time with links to APAC, America's powerful pro-Israel lobby. I'm arranging a to all the city friends of Israel. And basically, we're doing a, a, like a small lunch with a congressman from America. We're doing it, I'm doing it with APAC. Our investigation has already established this Israeli diplomat's links to numerous political groups in Britain, including the Parliamentary Lobby Group, the Labour Friends of Israel, or LFI. At the conference, Shai introduces our undercover reporter to LFI members at their stall. The Israeli diplomat advises the chair of the LFI about Robin's new role within her organization. You just met. Yeah, he's a volunteer to the fight well. Oh, yeah? And he's doing uh, the trying to get the young people. Oh, 
he's trying to arrange another investigation, maybe. Yeah. 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 Activist yeah. of the farm. Yeah. 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 They discuss paying for influential MPs to take a government-run tour of Israel. What happened with the names that we put into the embassy? And just now got the money. It's, one, it's more than one million pounds. It's a lot of money. And then, uh, and now I got the money. So from Israel. So it's not physical. Yeah, it's improvement. <laughs> and then, and now. You had it in your bag. The government of Israel has already budget allocated to the various ministries which can use it as they like to bring foreign delegations to Israel. It's part of the information campaign, you may call it propaganda campaign. Uh, so. The deputy Israeli ambassador to the UK arrives at the stall and is introduced to our undercover reporter. <laughs> this is Robin, he's uh, to meet you. now in, uh, in LFI to bring young people to do young LFI. And he's a young baby as well. <laughs> <laughs> and young baby as well. I hope that doesn't indicate any of us aren't of all this. Oh, no, no, it's not all of it. Would you like to... Oh, sorry, like, we want to start. Shai networked with pro-Israel labor activists. He offered assistance to the Jewish Leadership Council, an influential umbrella group of Jewish organizations in Britain. And he told me that there is a couple of things that you asked, you gel yeah, sure. uh, to arrange. So they wrote to, I mean, so I did to them a draft schedule. My understanding is it was, more of a, it was just more of an offer from us to them to help facilitate anything they need with some suggestions of what to do. Uh, but I don't know anything more than that at this point. They were better, they were amazing. They, just, they basically said, Shy, do whatever you want. That's good. And, um, I love when people get <laughs> While in Liverpool, Shy's confidence in Robin grows. The Israeli diplomat even goes so far as to introduce him as the chairman of the Young Labour Friends of Israel. Robin learns that pro-Israel activists are planning to attend a meeting organized by the Labour Friends of Palestine and the Middle East, the LFPME. On the way, he spots Luke Akehurst, the prominent pro-Israel operative within Labour, who Shai had told Robin to contact. Excuse me, Hello. Mr. Akehurst. Hi. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm the guy setting up the young and advice. Yeah, he was going for Sifra. We have an like, excellent progress now. We have the first signing up for 22 people on the mailing list. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Are you going to any events? The, to the LFPME thing? Yes, yes I am. Yes. Because I need to take notes on that. Oh, you're going to write something? No, no, just the internal provide one. Yep. It becomes clear that as well as Akehurst, other pro-Israel activists will be discreetly recording the event. Uh, oh, there's the Labour Friends of uh, the East by the 2.30, which yeah. I'll be going to, so I need to charge my phone up so I can get some more recordings. Ahead of the Palestine event, one member of the Israeli delegation contemplates wearing a T-shirt promoting Israel. She's dying for some action. Yeah, it is good. I, I wouldn't. If I mean, you wouldn't if you were. Well, I mean, uh, Akos is going to write to the reporter. These are our spies. Which right. <laughs> is why you can't wear that T-shirt because then they will everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah well, people shout at you. Well, you know, I was an intelligence officer. I can get the intel for you, no worries. While the Palestine event passed without incident, controversy did follow a private training session organized by the Jewish labor movement. Mike Katz works under Jeremy Newmark, the chairman of the Jewish labor movement. Newmark recently appointed Ella Rose as the JLM's new director. The training session was arranged following allegations of anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. 
It became a highly publicized matter for Jeremy Corbyn after an incident involving the former mayor of London. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. You had a disgusting Nazi apologist living still. A barrister, Shami Chakrabati, launched an inquiry and concluded that despite an occasionally toxic atmosphere, anti-Semitism was not endemic within the party. Anti-Semitism as a phenomenon across the world. Um, this is an example of 1992, Buenos Aires, into the embassy, pressure line killed, 242 injured. 2012, two school attacked, four killed. Obviously, in 2014, shortly after the awful attack in the, uh, in the country supermarket in Paris. The private JLM training session was about to have very public consequences for one attendee. At the start, it seemed relatively relaxed. Um, it was simply a training session. Um, and I think some of us had gone along there uh, with the idea that um, it was kind of strange, because in some ways this was going against what uh, Shamish Chakrabarti had actually advised. So we wanted to see what was going on. The CSC, the uh, community school, they recorded 557 incidents of across the UK in the first six months of 2016. That is an 11% increase in the period of 2014. 2014 was the most anti-Semitic year on record. One member of the audience challenges how the list was drawn up. Well, I'm wondering if I'm Finkelstein wrote in what many considered a humorous post that one way to deal with the occupation of Palestinian land was to move Israel to the United States. In the past, anti-Semitism was hating Jews for being Jews. Uh, and now Israel tries to extend it to say that this is any criticism about what Jews are doing uh, is also anti-Semitism. If you question the right of Israel to be a Jewish state, uh, then you are uh, not different from these classical anti-Semites. This goes back to the training session. They do this by saying, most Jews relate to Israel as being an important part of their identity. What you need to do is recognize that Israel is an integral part of the vast majority of Jewish communities. Therefore, if you attack Israel, you are attacking their identity. You've got to create a welcome. Welcome to Beit Israel. I think you need to be careful with your language and your references to the Holocaust. And what you might say, actually, de delegitimize that right of Israel, that basic right of Israel, as a country to exist. That is not appropriate. Zionism, Zion, not a term of abuse. And it's in any Labour Party can refer to Zionism is the political ideology that Israel has the right to exist as an exclusively Jewish homeland in historic Palestine. I'm Jewish, and I don't agree with the concept of a Jewish state because it gives me the right to live in Israel, whereas a Palestinian who's been displaced has a lot of right than me. So if you just think that's not appropriate, are you really saying it's not appropriate for us to have a political discussion? The Jews of Europe had the right to look for a safe haven. There's no doubt about it. When they were persecuted by anti-Semitic governments and movements, and definitely the Jews had to save themselves when this anti-Semitism has turned into the Nazi uh, uh, machine of destruction and genocide. The question is, do people who were persecuted in Europe have the right to displace people of another place. Can the abused become an abuser? You are so effectively that Zionism, you know, is not open to debate at a concept of Jewish state. That is really worrying. Anti-Semitic like any form of racism is deplorable 
And my feeling about how to tackle this is for Jews to be standing all the end squarely alongside black, our black fair comrades, our Muslim comrades, who are much more at the moment the target of racism than the people of the moment we are. As well as our undercover reporter, someone else was secretly recording the debate. <laughs> I'm laughing because um, by the time the row actually broke out, I was on my way home. I mean, none of us thought anything about this training session. I was in the car and suddenly I started to get these tweets coming through to me and these phone calls from the BBC. A secretly recorded clip was leaked to a news outlet. What was actually leaked were certain little segments that would be as controversial as possible. I'm the Holocaust today. I would also like to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if Holocaust Day was open to all people who have experienced Holocaust? And if the Jewish it community is. Is. It is. It is. for all the other As soon as I spoke, if you like, there was a ripple in the room. And I was just constantly interrupted. I'm not just Jewish, I am black. And my ancestry is of African enslavement. Only this year, I spoke at Slavery Remembrance Day and I spoke to a crowd in Trafalgar Square about the African Holocaust, and that is what we call it. You can disagree with me as to whether I should call that a Holocaust, but it's not anti-Semitic for me to call what happened to African people in the diaspora a Holocaust. I was speaking for information. And I still haven't heard a definition of anti-Semitism that I can work with. How it was reported and how it was tweeted was I was basically saying, I can't find anywhere a definition of anti-Semitism to work with. That's total nonsense. I'm an anti-racist trainer. I've been an anti-racist trainer for 40 years. I've been fighting fascists and anti-Semites on the streets for decades. The incident caused uproar in the British media. The Board of Deputies of British Jews called Walker an unapologetic Jew baiter. Walker was suspended from the Labour Party pending an investigation. Shortly afterwards, Robin meets the embassy's senior political officer. What do you think of that woman? Check the wall for her. Yeah, she's problematic. <laughs> I report every time she so can... yeah. In recent years, there is a growing tendency within the government to, to smear people who are anti-Israeli or anti-Zionist also to be anti-Semite. But not all anti-Israelis and, and anti-Zionists are anti-Semite. On the contrary. If they accuse anybody of anti-Semitism, it's basically as bad as kind of accusing somebody of being a paedophile or a murderer, you know. And it's really hard to come back from that. All right, have a good evening. Meanwhile, our undercover reporter spots Ella Rose across the road. News had broken of Ella's former job at the Israeli embassy, which had not been widely known. She's in tears because of what she considers anti-Semitic harassment. You're right. It's been a tough week. Tough week. Sweaty to You're right. Essentially, Electronic Intifada released that I worked at the embassy before JLM. Jackie Wolf has been slamming me online all week, and I just had to stand in front of her. It was really hard. It was really hard. It was over. I'm gonna go run a rally. So f you. F you. F you. Yeah, I do see what a lot of them. Oh my God. 
when our undercover reporter next met Ella, she had regained her composure. I saw Jackie walk her on Saturday and thought, you know what, I can take her. She's like five two and tiny. That's why I can take Jackie Walker. Start my guard training. Yeah, I'm not bad. If it came to it, I would win. That's all I really care about. Oh my gosh. Well, I kind of that says it all. I mean, you know, I don't even speak about people like that in that way that you would take somebody you would take somebody out and she's speaking about another jewish labor member in this way i think that's breathtaking it's absolutely breathtaking i'm, I'm just stunned the report that ella worked at the israeli embassy had appeared in the electronic intifada a pro-palestinian news website ella rose had been working for a year at the Israeli embassy in London, something that wasn't widely known at all, that had been, as far as I could ascertain, had been essentially covered up. Oh, Asa Winstanley! He was the one that wrote oh, no. the things about me. He's in They know they can't win when the debates are open, so they have to do these things behind closed doors. So when I'm outing her as um, an officer at the Israeli embassy and she didn't want that to be publicly known, yeah, she's not going to like that. She's, she's going to lash out. Look, at the end of the day, these people are sad, sad tosses. They're completely pathetic. They leave them in their corner where they belong. I'm very open to them and their existence. As far as I'm concerned, they can go die home. She's worked for the Israeli state. The Israeli state talks about a war against organizations like us. It's, it is a threatening thing to hear about, absolutely. What we need to have is some investigation of this from the Labour Party, and I will be making a formal complaint against both Ella Rose and the Jewish Labour movement. Happens. People are going to hate me no matter what, and they're always going to find something. It was all very anti-Semitic, to be honest. I'm a Zionist, I The Labour Party is holding its annual conference in Liverpool. For the first time, the leader of a major British party is an outspoken critic of Israel. The Israeli embassy has sent its senior diplomats to canvas opinion. Our undercover reporter attends a private meeting of sympathetic Labour activists. The ambassador, Mark Regev, tells them what to expect. Some of the, the people here are more Palestinian than the Palestinians. Yeah. And the fashion is, if you were on the left today, you are probably more from the very best to Israel. If not, you are not part of the city. Ambassador Regev suggests a message that should be delivered to other Labour Party members. Why are people who consider themselves progressive in Britain supporting reactionaries like Hamas and Hezbollah. We've got to say, in the language, I think, of social democracy, these people are misogynistic, they are homophobic, right? they are racist, they are anti-Semitic, they are reactionary. I think that's what we want to say. It's an important message. Jeremy Newmark, the chairman of the Jewish labor movement, reveals how the message worked. 
with a close ally of Jeremy Corbyn. Clive Lewis, MP for North South. Look, it's a real pleasure to have been invited here tonight. I've known Jeremy for over 20 years since my time working with the Jewish... Lewis's decision to condemn anti-Semitism at a JLM event was viewed as a tactical victory for the faction inside Labour that opposes Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn is the party's first openly pro-Palestinian leader. The faction that supports him is called Momentum. We already have actually intelligence that from the Momentum political director meeting last night, they passed a vote of censure in Clive Lewis just for coming to our meeting in Sweden. At the time, Jackie Walker was Momentum's vice chair. She believes that reports of a crisis of anti-Semitism were a consequence of the same ruthless party infighting. Some of us would say it was mostly a constructed crisis for political ends. I would say there is a crisis of the way that anti-Semitism is being manipulated and being used by certain uh, parts of not just the Labour Party, but other parties and the media to discredit Jeremy Corbyn and a number of his supporters. I mean, let's disagree politically. I'm anti-Zionist. They are pro-Zionist. Let's have that argument. Let's have that argument, not this sort that's going on at the moment, no. Everything is uh, wheels within wheels, you know? It's created a bit of division within momentum. The day before, I had a debate with Jeremy Newmark. At one point, he turned his back on the audience and whispered to me, you're a court Jew. Now, anybody who is Jewish understands what that means. If you were being abused as a black person in the same way, you would be being called a house nigger. Did you report it to anyone in the party? I told my partner and I told some friends that that had happened. It's very hard to use a system which is so discredited, which the compliance unit is. Shai Massot, whose job at the embassy includes liaising with pro-Israel groups in Britain, ends the meeting with a summary of his achievements. The numbers, this year we did more than 50 events in the campuses of the universities of wow. the embassy. There are more than 100 events that happened by the Islamic society, by the cell that they arranged in the campuses. And uh, in addition to that, more than, I think, eight receptions for young people in the embassy, including two big three receptions of 300 people that came, you know, uh, from the parliament. I, I would take a picture. Yeah. Can I take a picture of you? Yeah, Back at the LFI stall, Shai and the Israeli delegation continued debating whether to wear the pro Israel t shirts. Shai has a dream. Shai has a dream. I'm going to make it come true today. He wants me to put on the t shirt. But you know, as Robin is my witness, I was going to put on that t shirt today. And... I have a dream that the activists will not be ashamed of what he's representing. I'm not ashamed of what I'm representing. It's a t shirt and it's. It's such a huge message. <laughs> I'm a genuine, it's a genuine, it's not a, it's a genuine question if you say. One party member was attending her first conference. I heard there was a Labour Friends of Israel stall. And I thought this would be a really good opportunity to have a dialogue with a group I know who have a lot of influence. And it would be very interesting to hear their ideas. So I found where their stall was. Can I just ask you, yes, you're very anti the um, settlements. What, what, what is Labour Friends of Israel doing about We make our view clear and we meet with people at all levels in Israeli politics and um, diplomatic um, circles, etc. And we make it absolutely clear we're not Friends of Israel and Elizabeth Palestine. Hence our. Um, 
can you uh, campaign launching next month and that we're showcasing here? We believe in a two-state solution in coexistence and self-determination for both people. And that's really important. How would that come about, do you think? Well, our job is to support at any possible means that can bring it about. So what, 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 what are we supporting this coexistence project, which is what this is about? I had no idea quite honestly, who was behind the stall. There was a woman behind the stall. My first series of questions from memory was simply to say, I was very interested to know how a two-state solution would come about. What would be the details? Not a slogan, but the details. Supporters of a two-state solution believe that a peace deal based on national boundaries that existed in 1967, before Israel's occupation, will one day lead to a viable Palestinian state. But the continued growth of Israeli settlements and occupied land has made an independent state all but impossible. If you look at a map of the West Bank and East Jerusalem today, you are looking at a fragmented territory that Israel has colonized now for almost half a century. Practically speaking, a two-state solution is just not possible under these conditions. I was actually seeking some reassurance that a two-state solution, if that's what they were promoting, was still possible. This is a, a big situation. And we want a two-state solution. I said time and again, I'm here to talk about the two-state solution which you are promoting. And this is what I'd like to learn about. It's clear that the Israeli state, no matter which party is in power, has got absolutely no desire or inclination to relinquish the territories occupied after 1967. But the questions that that throws up are the kinds of questions that people don't want to ask or don't want to answer. Anyone who supports Israel has to ask himself or herself the following question. There are two possible scenarios, and only two possible scenarios. Either I support the new state of Israel, which is an ethnic apartheid state, or I support a change of regime in Israel, namely that this, the state and the country as a whole would go through a genuine process of democratization, as did uh, apartheid South Africa. There is no third option. It's Thank you, Jean. I've enjoyed the conversation. No, I'm I'm not, no, I'm asking you about the uh, settlements. They've totally atomized the whole of the West Bank. I'm asking you, I'm really genuinely interested. How is do two state solution? Two states. So how can it come about if yeah. the whole of the West Bank is atomized? So so but in practical terms, the impact of the friends of Israel, that's what you're doing. In terms, of, in terms of the West Bank is atomized, where will the state be? Um, that is a genuine, genuine question. Where will the state be? The activist who came to ask her tough questions about the settlements, actually, that was her main point. She didn't ask her about Judaism or the existence of Israel. She just wanted a straight answer. How does anyone who supports Israel justify the settlements? We witness, but nothing changes. I was quite interested in whatever funds they had and influence they had, how would this bring about a two-state solution? That was my very basic question. 
You've got a lot of money, you've got a lot of prestige in the world. I don't know where you get that. Sorry? Where the Prince goes through? We've got a lot of free on that money. Well, I think so. I hear that you know, it's a stepping stone to good jobs. A friend of mine's son's got a really good job at Oxford University on the basis of having worked for Labour Friends of Israel. If you just oh, believe yes. rumours, then it's not rumours of that. It's anti-Semitic. No, it's not. It's, 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 not. it's not. It's about conspiracy. It's not. It's not. Sorry, it is. It's not. Anyway, I that's am... my view, and I think we have I'm to agree to differ. No, I don't um, think we do have to agree to differ. Well, I'm agreeing to differ. I'm, to differ. I'm ending the conversation, because I am not really... Um, wishing to engage in a conversation that talks about getting involved with this and then you get a good job in the in, 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 in Oxford or the city or but do you think that, that Joan Ryan falsely claimed that Jean referred to jobs in the city, London's financial centre. And it comes very clearly in the discussions that you have filmed that the woman was not anti-Semitic. They know it. She didn't talk like an anti-Semitic person. She was a typical pro-Palestinian person who was worried about the violations of, human, of the Palestinian human and civil rights. Ryan continued to reference banking, a traditional anti-Semitic trope, as she left the conference hall with our undercover reporter. But Jean had never mentioned it. At no point did I ever say that Labour Friends of Israel will get people jobs in banking in the city. I did say, which is absolutely true, that I know the son of a friend of mine who he believed himself that having some connection with Labour Friends of Israel didn't harm his career at all. That evening, at a rally to combat anti-Semitism organized by the Jewish labor movement, Joan Ryan described her day at the stall. We have also had three incidents of anti-Semitic harassment on our stand. Two people who are stopping that stall today. And that, I can tell you something about why we need to be having this against anti-Semitism rally. By the following day, word had spread about Jean's exchange at the LFI stall. Several MPs came by and expressed concern, including Jeremy Corbyn's former challenger, Angela Eagle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we had a, a couple of problems yesterday, but yeah, no, today's been better. Where we did have one person uh, towards the end of the day come and say the uncertainty was just being used to crush Jeremy, and that the allegations are sort of made up to a certain extent which is obviously awful, but compared with stuff yesterday, it's sort of not quite as bad. <laughs> Some of that sort of stuff is now becoming normalised. Sort of less shocks about that than I was about where that happened yesterday. That's just I know, I know, I know about it. How are you anyway? Are you OK? Oh, I'm absolutely loving it. <laughs> As well as Jean's case, other alleged incidents of anti-Semitism involve the attempt to replace the labor leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Another prominent Corbyn opponent arrives at the stall and hugs Jennifer Gerber, the director of the LFI. Labor MP Shuka Umana asks for an update on the anti-Semitic incidents. Oh, God, yeah. We... So, one Nazi came up and basically said it was true. Uh, Ron Bojus, Jewish MPs, and Jewish Marinas, uh, and Andrew Eagle's husband. He's Jewish. Jewish. <laughs> uh, no, you can make up with him. <laughs> we were pushing for the And then Jeremy Corbyn came up and said, Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Joan, you were Joan's at the other instance. Right. The other instance yesterday. Uh, I reported that incident. That woman. She took a video of me then. Joan Ryan, Labour Friends of Israel, working away while I answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. She didn't show any of the bits where she said, you know, you're yeah. being anti Semitic. Yeah. That's obviously yeah. coming to an end. So I made like. formal complaints. So well, yeah. I am very shocked about the way she described my words to other people. I feel very anxious and that she should be 
misinterpreting me totally to other people. I find that very, very worrying. But I mean, I read yeah, yeah, it down, you know, like, all this what she was saying about being rich <laughs> oh, and the cows. Yeah, 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 yeah. One who went to yeah. Oxford, I mean, and the next minute like, he's got a big job in banking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I said that, you know, classic anti-Semitic. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. I have no idea how she got from A to Z, going from my comment, which was what it was, to then saying he got a, a big job in banking. Maybe she believes her own trope, if that's the word they use. We had a woman say, no, 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 I've, I've never, I've, I've never seen this. So my Jewish friends have. They said, well, it is real. Is it real? Is it really real? It's just been yeah. used to crush oh, yeah. corn. Yeah. And I said, and I said, there's a bit, you know, as a Jew, like, would you say that to any other, you know, like, I've experienced homophobia, yeah. but I don't deny it. But anyway, it's only for you, I guess. Yeah. That's the way it's uh, out of it. Yeah, do you know what most people have been positive and yeah. nice? It's kind of like solidarity. People are coming up like solidarity. Solidarity, guys. Are you okay? How's your day? It's disgraceful. Yeah. We'll prevail. Yeah. We'll prevail in yeah. I like that. Definitely. It's in a way pathetic, uh, but it's also worrying how such a pathetic uh, evidence can, and we know, can be used to intimidate Jeremy Corbyn into establishing an inquiry commission, in making daily confessions that he's not anti-Semitic, and so on. That is, I think, going to be the defining narrative, actually, now, which is anti-Semitism. And do you know what? That denies, you know, what I found, I said to her, you heard me a couple of times saying, I find that upsetting that as a Jew, yeah. you're telling me, like, and she didn't give up. Yes. Yeah. Like, I think it's, if an anti-Semite comes, like, you know, if somebody says to me, Jews, they're all f***ing big noses and you control the world. I'm like, wow, but you're, you're an anti-Semite, that's terrible. Someone like her worries me more, because is she an anti-Semite? I don't know. But she basically denies the fact that it exists. She just thinks it's made up. And the group I... discusses which act of alleged anti-Semitism was worse. Okay. Ruben believes that Jean's discussion with Joan Ryan was amongst the most serious. It's just been a bit of a Anti-Semitism. Difficult moments, women who told us that anti-Semitism, you know, is being concocted to crush Corbyn. That is what she said, and I think people, like, if we're not make, getting it out there. Yeah. 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 But is that anti-Semitic, guys? I don't know. Like. That's the guy. I don't. I don't, I don't know where my line is anymore. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I think it's different to today. I think and it makes you feel uncomfortable. I mean, that's the point at which you call it out and report it. And that's why Joan convinced me to report the one yesterday, yeah. because I was made to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And although nothing anti-Semitic was said, I'm sure it had, was, there were undertones of it, and mm. it, was, the con it was brought upon by that yeah. context. I thought Labour Friends of Israel were talking about Palestine because they were promoting a two-state solution. Now I find they don't want to talk about Palestine. And if you do talk about Palestine, it would appear you're kind of sucked into having uh, an accusation of anti-Semitism brought against you. At the end of the day, if you, if you feel offended by it and uncomfortable for it, this should be a safe space and anything that breaks that should be reported. Yeah. I think. There is that line, obviously. So they're really scratching the bottom of the barrel to make a list of two and a half cases of anti-Semitism. Two out of the three, uh, they themselves are not totally sure that they fall into their own strict definition of anti-Semitism. Jean was unaware that her exchange with Joan Ryan had made national news and that a complaint of anti-Semitism was lodged. I felt overwhelmed by being at the conference. I had no idea there would be so many things to go to, so many interesting workshops to go to, seminars at the same time as people speaking in the main hall. My husband hadn't been very well, so we actually left a day early. Shortly after, 
Joan Ryan's assistant emailed Robin asking him to be a witness to Gene's alleged act of anti-Semitism. Yeah, I kind of feel it was an anti-Semitic you know, trope against Israel and like Jews controlling and having power and, and money. I thought it was, I think, although she didn't say Jews and she said Israel, it's definitely on the line, do you know what I mean? Because this, if she had said the word Zionist, I would have said 100%, 100%. Despite being unsure of what he had witnessed, Richardson had no qualms about the expulsion of a fellow Labour Party member. How it works is, you know, you make the complaint to the Malay Party within their own rules will decide. I, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect this woman um, might be potentially banned. She did say something that was anti-Semitic. After Jean had left the conference, she was contacted by a Labour Party investigator. He would only say that it was about a serious incident. I was thinking, had I seen a fire take place? Had I seen someone throw a bottle? Had I seen a fight break out? I was really racking my brain, thinking, what incident had I seen? Was I aware of? Was I a witness to something? And almost by return came an email that it was my conduct that was being investigated. I was totally shocked. That was like a real bombshell. The annual conference of Britain's opposition Labour Party is continuing in Liverpool in the north of England. The gathering is important for Israel because for the first time the party leader is a supporter of the BDS movement. Robin, our undercover reporter, has been with members of the Labour Friends of Israel. Shai Massot had conceived a plan to attract young pro-Israel Britons to the Labour Party, what he called the Young LFI. He promoted Robin as their chairman. Now it seems the young LFI is about to become operational. I don't know what you're trying to make me and says he very empty out of money, which is good. It's happened to help fund a couple of events, like the community of Tony. I don't have money for it, but it's just, uh, it's just getting organized off the ground now, really. By now, our undercover reporter had become a trusted confidant of the Israeli embassy's senior political officer. But suddenly, he wants a private word. Yeah, I want to speak with you. This is doing actually over a coffee, but yeah, just let's do it on the way to the event. So it appears that something has changed. When I, I was drunk or whatever, I introduced you like uh, working with young LFIs. Actually, it's not an official position yet. Shai had earlier introduced our undercover reporter as the new chairman of the Young LFI. It was an idea. It's an idea that I cannot implement because yeah. I am not a young uh, Labour friend of Israel or young uh, British guy. Yeah. It's not relevant to me at all. I am an official. I can give you an idea and I can help you with everything, but I'm not relevant to you at all. Just, you know, I'm a tool for you to help you if you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. If you decided to get the idea. So you you don't coordinate too much with them or...? I'm coordinating a lot of things with them, but I'm not their boss. My position is that if you need help um, with, you know, to connect you to the groups, to bring you to the places, I can do that. But you cannot be affiliated with me and you cannot, like, uh, uh, use me or, or as someone that said something. Sure. Yeah. It's not relevant. I'm not relevant to anything. I'm just working in the embassy. On the following day, Hyatt's newspaper reported on a leaked cable from the Israeli embassy in London. The memo accused an Israeli government ministry, Strategic Affairs, of operating British Jewish organizations in a way that could put them in violation of British law.
the Minister of Strategic Affairs may use local groups which are entitled uh, as British civilians to counter BDS. They may be in touch with them, they may instruct them, they may support them, but but they would be very, very careful not to violate, as a state, the laws and the sovereignty of, of other nations. You cannot say, yeah, Shay said it's fine that I will volunteer to you, because I'm not, I, I'm not the one who, you know, taking the decisions to tell okay. a I'm sorry if I brought you into trouble. No, I, I am, I'm totally fine. Okay, good. It's just important that, you know, that's, that's yeah. clear. I'm not, but... So if I'm giving you like an idea, it's like you know, friendly ideas. It's in a friend way. It's it's off the record. It's not something that you can use. So, but then, but there's, I mean. If, I mean, if you are feel like you like the idea, so you got an idea from a friend to do a delify. It's fine that that will be that friend. But in the bottom line, it's not uh, like. Uh, it's not like. Uh, it's not like. Uh, that I have a say in that idea. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, do you get it? <laughs> That's politics. If you were trying to fool the British people by setting up a front organization which masquerades or says that it's is genuine uh, friends of Israel but actually is run from Tel Aviv, that's troubling. Just imagine if there's a great big sort of apparently spontaneous pro-Iranian organization in Britain and it turned out that it was run from Tehran or inspired by Tehran that would be outrageous the annual event run by the labor friends of Israel was one of the most anticipated at the conference the party leader always attends the LFI chairperson kicked off proceedings we must campaign flat out against the BDS movement and all those who seek to demonize the state of Israel to single out uniquely the world's only Jewish state and call for it to be boycotted. That is anti-Semitic and we should say so loudly. It's very surprising that people suddenly were talking about fundamental issues of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party once a certain person was elected as the leader. Ladies and gentlemen, the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. That's the only reason people were looking for anti-Semitism. And you know, if you look for something, you will always find it, whether it exists or it doesn't exist. And I want to thank Joan Ryan as chair of LFI for the work that she's done and the way that she represents the... The sudden onset of anti-Semitic claims led Jeremy Corbyn to publicly engage with Labour's pro-Israeli groups. The Labour Party is not a home for anti-Semitism in any form. I do not intend to allow it to be. We will reduce the report to deal with that. Kind of live with that for the time being. Yeah. It gets through another year. In the past, Israel has grown used to unchallenged support from across the British political establishment. That cross-party consensus allowed Israel a free hand, enabling it to build illegal settlements on Palestinian lands. I'm sure many people are pleased to hear your commitment to the two-state solution and your commitment to fight anti-Semitism wherever it appears, in our party or in the wider society. In private, Israel has another message. Corbyn and the global BDS movement that he supports threatens the political status quo that has tolerated Israel's occupation of Palestinian lands for half a century. Corbyn is One of the things that he doesn't understand, he doesn't get, is that at the moment that you get the leadership, you need to drop all of the weirdos, the extremists. It's good that they were your campaigners. You cannot build a government from extremists. And he doesn't want to do that. He wants to stay with all of those weirdos. Back at her London home, the woman who confronted Joan Ryan over the construction of Jewish-only settlements had received a message. She had become the subject of a formal Labour Party investigation. 
that the following allegation has been brought against you regarding your conduct at the Labour Party conference 2016. Thank you, Jane. I've enjoyed the conversation. I know, I know, no, I'm asking you about a settlement they've told. When the lady who I now subsequently learn was Miss Ryan accused me the allegations was that I was being anti-semitic I was just appalled totally atomized the whole of the West Bank I'm asking you I'm really genuinely interested how was do two state solution two state solution the complaint alleged that Jean constantly suggested that the LFI had lots of money and power when in fact she had said once the LFI has money and prestige. Nor did Jean mention a high paying job. As a concluding paragraph, his summary says, the above incidents and allegations leveled at me left the complainants feeling victimized, intimidated, and both felt the incident contained what they both described as incidents of anti Semitism. I reported that incident. Have you? That woman. I made formal complaints. After several weeks, the investigation cleared her name. That they should be the ones to feel victimized and intimidated from a member of the public, a member of the Labour Party, approaching a stall where they're purporting to give information and presumably wanting to discuss the two-state solution. I, I just find that almost, I mean, laughable if it weren't so affecting of me i know now that it can apps impact on people's lives i am just a regular citizen who is concerned about what is happening in the middle east and not to be able to talk about that without being accused of being anti-semitic i find deeply worrying i think that is quite shameful back at the israeli embassy in london Shai Masot remained keen to find a role for Robin. He invited our undercover reporter to meet an experienced parliamentary operator, Maria Strizolo. <laughs> you must have arrived one second after me. Oh, yeah. Both were on time for their meeting. As they waited for Shai to emerge from the embassy, it turns out that Strizolo has met two of Shai's superiors in Israel. The one time I was late, um, actually, she's uh, Shai's boss. I met her in uh, Jerusalem when I was there in the summer. <laughs> the one time I was late, she was on time. <laughs> Last year, I met her with her boss a couple of times with my then boss because they wanted to discuss things like, you know, Problems. Yeah. <laughs> with Who did the you UK work for, then? I used to work for um, an MP, a minister, really. Uh, yeah. Who's that? Yeah. Robert Halfen. Halfen? Yes. The British civil servant began to educate our undercover reporter on how the Israel lobby works inside Parliament, and especially the Conservative Party. How many of the MPs from your party are in CFI? Oh, we're very interested in the annual lunch, which is just before Christmas. Basically, the whips always make sure the light bulbs come after the CFI lunch because like, all the parties there. Whips are party loyalists who ensure MPs turn up whenever they are needed to vote. And uh, the PM. And the PM and the Chancellor and the Foreign Secretary and everyone. When we're talking about the construction of British policy towards the Middle East, towards the Palestinians, towards the Israelis, you can't describe that without taking into account the fact that the Israeli government has a very powerful ally in the shape of the Conservative Friends of Israel and they do play a, they do brilliantly, brilliant job at getting the Israeli uh, point of view of, across. The parliamentary officer described the ease with which the CFI's information was accepted by MPs. If at least you can get a small group of MPs that you can always rely on. 
when there is something coming to target and whenever you brief them you say you don't have to do anything we're going to give you this feature we're going to give you the information we're going to look around for you then I think it becomes easier and from that you have a group of my drawing about the ground so if you if you prepare everything for them, it's harder for them to say, oh no, I don't have time. You know, so if, if they already have the question to table for you know, it's hard to say, oh no, 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 Strazzolo boasted about how her efforts once made an immediate impact on the national debate. I was in Israel with their fight when, uh, when they had uh, found the three kids that had been kidnapped in 2014. And I was on the phone with Rob to explain things to table a question for Prime Minister question time for paying um, tribute. Yeah. And also tabling an urgent question. To, yeah, yeah, to get a statement from the government on the three kids. Mr. Robert Halfon. Yeah. 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 Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the world has seen the tragic and brutal murders of three Israeli youngsters, most probably by Hamas. Will my honourable friend give the Israeli government every support, possible support at this time? And does he not agree with me that far from showing restraint, Israel must do everything possible to take out Hamas terrorist net networks? And will he give the Israeli government support in this? I think it's very important that Britain will stand with Israel as it seeks to bring to justice those who are responsible. By now, the senior political officer at the Israeli embassy had become a trusted confidant of our undercover reporter. It's quite funky. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I'd rather go for this one. Yeah. Shai invited Robin to attend a meeting organized in part by the City Friends of Israel, a group he earlier said that he was establishing. It's not like you got along with Israelis. You have to Israelis. Well, where did we get along? Yeah, that's amazing how you do that. Hello, sir. Thank you very much. Maria Strazzolo was also there. Discussion turned to Donald Trump. So he's an unpredictable person. The only thing that you, you, you know you can, I mean, from Israel's perspective, you, you can think that he's like steady in his area. Is the fact that his daughter is a Jewish. She converted to Judaism. The meeting had been coordinated with AIPAC the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee, perhaps Washington's most powerful lobby group. It is not widely known that AIPAC has a presence in London. As a European and somebody who lives in the Western world and enjoys its individual freedoms, I also view, and I hope most of you do as well, I view Israel as the battleground where uh, modernity and Western values meet the forces that want to destroy uh, that way of life. Focus campaign. Joe Richards from APAC's Wall Street Division summed up their operations. Today, uh, we're a pretty robust organization where we have one single mission, which is to make sure that the United States and Israel remain very close together in the relationship in many different ways. And the way we do that is by relationship building with our 535 members of Congress, 100 in the Senate, 435 in the House. APAC's guests explain to Robin their interest in Britain. The real strategic goal is to get the UK to behave more like the US than Europe when it comes to Israel. So, and to kind of pull them, tug them into the US sphere. By this point, Robin was well aware of the Israeli diplomats' close ties with America's pro-Israel lobby. I went to APAC last year because I, I organized the American British delegation to APAC. It was me and the British donor. Who is like around 30, 40, which kind of was just sponsoring the CFI, CFI conservatives as well, some of the, the labor as well. And we all went together to APAC. But in the bottom line, we have a, a donor meeting with this head of strategy in APAC, and he met us basically to teach us, you know, give us some ideas to Britain. Shai then announced another audacious plan involving a front company set up by the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, whose mandate is to fight BDS. So the Strategic Affairs, they asked me, they are establishing a new company, a new private company, basically 
would work for a, the Israeli government. It's like kind of outside company, whatever. The Ministry of Strategic Affairs has called it a secret war, potentially involving what this prominent Israeli reporter described as dirty tricks. When I say dirty tricks, they can smear people, uh, activists, BDS activists or others. They can um, hack their emails in order to collect information about what they are up to. They can, you know, trash people. It's going to be an office of 20 people, so the position that they suggested to me to do is to be the liaison for the international communities around the world. So it's good sometimes, because, you know, it's good to work with APAC and the others, and you know, the other, you know, the five of them, it's good. It's good. And the last position that I applied for, that there is a slightly chance I will get, it, actually, is to be the... The head of the Foreign Affairs Department of the Intelligence uh, Department in Israel. I, I'm not a, a career. I am political policy. So I came just for one position to uh, assist in political issues. that specific. Sometimes you need someone to take care just of that. We focus on that. That's what I do. At ease and with the trust of his dinner companions, Shai floated the idea of a parliamentary plot. Can I give you some MPs that I suggest you will take down? <laughs> well, you know, if you look hard enough, I'm sure that there is something that we're trying to find. Yeah, I have some MPs. Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. No, she knows which MPs want to ask the question. Yeah, it's good to remind me. <laughs> the deputy for minister. This exchange between the political officer of um, the Israeli embassy and a parliamentary staffer about taking down, is the phrase used, Alan Duncan is outrageous, it's shocking. This is uh, clearly a deliberate attempt by a foreign government to interfere in the workings of British democracy and to secure the destruction of the career of a minister in the British government. We recognized Israel in 1950 when they didn't have any clear borders, they didn't have a capital city, and now it's high time to do the same for Palestine. You still want to have a problem. Yeah. No, you're doing a lot of problems. I thought we had. Sounds like a good thing. You're going to miss your eyes a little bit. No? No, I don't know. Ah. Boris is good. Boris? He basically is good. Yeah, he, he just doesn't care. He's busy with other things. Boris is busy, you know? He's, you know, he is an idiot, but he, so far, but so far, he became the Minister of Foreign Affairs without any kind of responsibility. So technically, if something will happen, it won't be his fault. The parliamentary officer then recalled how Sir Alan Duncan had once confronted her boss, the MP Robert Halfen. Rob was uh, writing articles to the internet, doing everything, asking questions and what was about, yeah. about uh, the terrorist salaries. Ah, oh, when it was terrorist uh, salaries. Yeah, and uh, and after a while, Rob was doing a lot of it. I don't think he said it took him. Like I think I don't remember exactly, but he took him on the side and started it. I certainly think that she needs to explain what she was doing. We want to know whether any further steps were taken towards getting rid of, taking out Mr. Duncan. 
I think we need to know a lot more about the background to this. What else was going on to damage the Foreign Office Minister? It strikes me that this is the sort of job which the intelligence services should do, to have a good look at what's going on. Britain's domestic spy agency, MI5, includes in its definition of espionage, seeking to influence decision-makers and opinion-formers to benefit the interests of a foreign power.